It's a mindset from the pits of hell that any that money's evil in and of itself. No, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, not money itself. And people get the idea just like that commenter. It's like, so if money's so bad, if money's so evil, most people say that they work a job. And if they don't work a job, they're mooching off somebody who does work a job. Oh, you don't want to work a job to earn money because it's so evil. But you'll you'll stay in somebody's house who's working and you're not working. They're paying for your shelter. They're paying for electricity. They're paying for the internet that you're using to write the comment that you wrote to me. I'm not saying this is what the guy who wrote the comment to me did, but I'm just saying, church, there's people out there who are like that. They'll see money as evil and wicked and they'll still work a job. I'm like, okay, if it's so bad, stop working or give me your paycheck. I'll take it. If money's so bad, give me your paycheck. Why are you even earning it? <laughs> and if you're not earning it, they're mooching off somebody who is earning it. So is money really that evil? Let's be real. The living wage in the U.S. is $25.02 per hour in 2022 or $104,077 per year before taxes. If you want to live comfortably as a family in America in 2024, you need to make six figures if you are the single earner in the household. Much of the church is denying the reality of the new livable wage in America. Let me show you a response. I believe he has good intentions. But I made a video, church, about how a Christian man should work for and aim to make six figures in America, especially if he's planning or already has started a family. That is what a Christian man should do because we're called to be the provider in the household. And so most in 2024, you have most people, uh, most families doing dual income households, meaning the wife and the husband's working. But as believers, we're called to be separate from the world and traditionally Generally, the man is the provider, the main provider, if not the only provider. And 2024 has definitely changed. And so I'm not going to get on any Christian man who has their wife working for whatever reason. But I believe every Christian man should focus on being, if need be, being able to solely provide and provide well for the whole family. If she can't work for whatever reason, something happens and you're the only one that could earn that income we as men, men of God, are called to be the providers of the house. That is not the wife's role. And so that's specifically what I've been teaching recently on my channel. And a lot of people in the church, a lot of Christians have been coming against it. And so I'm going to read you this comment now from this brother right here. And so he says, not everybody can make six figures. And let me stop that right there. That's already false. Specifically in the context of the video that he's addressing, I'm talking about in America. Maybe it's not possible in some other countries where you're literally enslaved by the government and it's communist dictatorship. You know, if you're in North Korea, yeah, I could see how that could be impossible, making six figures there. But if you're in a Western country, and specifically I'm talking about America, it is possible for every Christian man to make that. And what kind of faithless statement is that? I mean, come on, God can do anything. And so if God specifically wants you or calls you to make six figures, and that's in your destiny for you to do that. He wants you to do that. Why is that impossible? He's literally stating it's impossible for that to happen. Not everybody can make six figures. So continuing, he says, no matter how hard they work, some people will not make that. Again, he's in a state of lack, mental lack. It is possible. Every Christian man should be working hard, but the reality is, okay, let's see what the reality is. That's just not the reality for every person. Yeah, currently, but you can work towards that. Be careful because the enemy can easily twist some hardworking, struggling person situation and make them think that God has no favor for them. That is not what I'm saying at all, at all. If somebody is struggling by circumstance and it, it, hard times fall on anybody, hard times can fall on the world, hard times can even fall on God's people. In fact, hard times fall on God's people a lot. So things happen, bad things happen. We're not promised a uh, happy, just lollipop, <laughs> We're not promised a life of flowers and roses and lollipops and everything is going to go 100% right all the time. No, hard times do fall on good people. So I don't know why he's warning against this, warning me against this, because that is not at all what I'm teaching. I don't teach that every rich person has God's favor on them and every poor person is lacking God's favor. That is not what I teach at all. All I'm teaching, all I was teaching in that specific video was that it is possible for every Christian man in America, able-bodied and able-minded, 
to make six figures plus on their own, no dual income. The man alone can make that. It's possible. How is that impossible? All things are possible through Christ. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. I mean, I'm going to go over some scriptures. We're going to go over some scriptures after this comment to just, you know, give you guys some hope and just grow the faith of whoever's watching that it is possible if you are struggling financially to get out of that situation that God actually wants you to thrive financially. Yes, God wants us to thrive financially. This is a statement that I'm going to be accused of as being a prosperity gospel teacher. No, <clears throat> God does not want you to be in poverty. God doesn't necessarily want you to be rich, filthy rich either. And you see how these terms come together from the world. People associate filth with wealth. They say filthy rich. This is all brainwashing. All of it is brainwashing. Not every rich person is filthy and evil and wicked. This is all brainwashing. goes back to Hollywood and everything. You see in all the Disney movies, like all the rich people are just messed up, have bad character, evil, it's, it's not like that. There were men in the Bible, good men of God who were wealthy financially. Boaz, wealthy man of God. Job, wealthy man of God. And in fact, it was the devil who attacked Job and attacked his finances and brought poverty to Job. The devil attacked Job in multiple ways, physically, you know, mentally, emotionally, and his finances. The devil brings poverty poverty. God allowed it, but the devil brought it. So folks, God does not want us to be in poverty. Why? That doesn't make any sense. That's like saying God wants us to be sick and have diseases. No, God doesn't want that. That's like saying God wants us to just fail in all our relationships. No, God doesn't want that. God doesn't necessarily promise us a good life either, but he doesn't want us to just suffer just for suffering's sake. That's silly. The devil brings death, sickness, disease, all that type of stuff. The devil brings that. God can allow it and use it for his purposes, but it comes by the devil. It's almost like saying, hey, God wants me to have cancer. What? <laughs> he may allow it, but it's like God doesn't want us just to be sick. Like It's, it's silly to, to say something like that. It's the same thing as saying, God wants me to be broke. So then he says, you should obviously want to do better, but this new era is strategically set up to financially cripple everyone, including Christians. And that's my point. You know, the economy is really bad. That means we need to make more money because the economy is so bad. Is judgment? Um, I don't know what, what's going on with his theology right there. I think that's just his own theology, his own thinking. Thinking that the economy is so bad that it's God's judgment on... I, this is confusing. Like, what is he saying? It doesn't mean hardworking Christians who don't make six figures have failed. And I'm not saying that. <laughs> Nobody said that. The economic goalpost is constantly being moved. Yeah, because of inflation. Inflation. So we need to constantly improve our financial um, area of our lives because inflation is constant. The economy is constant and things just seem to be getting worse. Focus on living fully for Christ. Amen. I teach that. I recommend that. I'm not saying anything against that. Don't let money become a stumbling block for you. And so what he's doing is a lot of mind reading. He's trying to read my mind and trying to think and state what I believe and what I think. He thinks he knows what I'm thinking about money and that I'm not putting God first. And he's, he's insinuating all this type of stuff, but he doesn't even know me like that. Steward your money well and live for spiritual things not carnal. See, he's just assuming. <laughs> and what do they say about assuming? Assuming makes an ass out of you and me. So it's not good to assume. It's not good to mind read, to think you know somebody, what somebody's thinking when you don't. All I'm saying in that video, it's like, you see the connections there is poverty consciousness. For me to motivate my brothers and sisters in Christ in this hard economy, which he's admitted, it's crippling. It's becoming crippling. And I'm trying to motivate my brothers and sisters in Christ to earn more finances so that they don't have to be crippled. So that you don't just sit by and, and let time pass by and let your financial situation get worse and worse and worse. And I'm motivating the church to do better, to actually put in that work, to grind. We're men. That's what we do. Grind. Put in that work. So we can provide for our families and our future generations, which we're called to do in the Bible. A good man stores up wealth for his children's children. So we're called to think about our future. Be smart to be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Be smart about your finances. 
save up, store up wealth. Not so you can take it with you to heaven because you can't take your wealth with you to heaven. Not to sin to attain that wealth. Not to put wealth as your number one priority, but we're called to steward, to steward our finances correctly, to think about our future generations so that we can hand down the value that we created in this life to our future generations. This is what a wise man of God does. He's smart with his finances. He stewards it, and then he constantly increases his skills and his values and his wisdom to be more efficient in earning money. So you can earn more money in less time. Wise men in general <laughs> have wealth because they can use that wisdom to earn and create value. With wisdom comes the ability to earn and create value efficiently. And so that's a big reason why I believe with Solomon's wisdom came wealth. Solomon asked for wisdom, but God gave him wealth. But essentially, I think these two things are very like co-entangled. With wisdom can easily come wealth. And so I ask God for that first wisdom. And if wealth comes my way, praise God. Praise God for that. But you see that guy's comment when I read it? And when you read it, you might think of this scripture right here. This is what it reminds me of like perfectly. Matthew 8, 23 through 27. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea. Yo, Jesus is amazing. He's Yahweh. He's God. He rebuked the winds in the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, what manner of man is this? <laughs> Jesus is God. That's what type of man he is. 100% God, 100% man. That even the winds in the sea obey him. And so Jesus looked at his disciples who were in fear of dying or perishing and said, Oh ye, oh ye of little faith. Oh ye of little faith. Why are ye fearful? And that brings me to my next set of scriptures, family. This is so good. I hope you're enjoying this. This is Matthew 17, starting with verse 14. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he followed into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to the, thy disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long, suffer, how long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus, this is important part, watch this. All of it is important, but this is the real meat that I'm trying to convey right here. And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. I'll repeat that. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. You can move mountains with that faith that's as small as a grain of mustard seed. And you shall say to this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place. And it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Does this remind you of another scripture? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, going back to this comment that I just showed you, you're going to see how these scriptures tie into what he was saying, how he came at it. Now, let's read this again and compare this to the scripture. Not everyone can make six figures already, already, O oh, ye of little faith. And look, I'm not trying to sun you, I'm not trying to take you down. This is just a rebuke if you're watching this. If you're watching this, this is a rebuke. You can compare this against the scriptures. This is a lack of faith. He's lacking faith here. I don't know what, what's causing it. Maybe, you know, somebody can try to try to go on an endeavor to maybe get a better job or maybe start a business and they, and they ended up not succeeding for whatever reason. Or they don't believe in themselves. So they don't believe, they don't have the faith necessary required. He's coming at it from his lack of faith. He's saying, not everyone can make six figures. In America, as a man, able-bodied and able-minded, it is possible. <laughs> you can move mountains. You can move mountains. Mustard seed of faith. Moving mountains. 
What does that mean? Does that mean literally moving mountains? I mean, I don't think so. But what basically what it means is anything that you can think of that doesn't go against the laws of physics in this world, you can achieve it through the power of God. If it's in his will, you can achieve it. And yes, it is in God's will for some of his children to make six figures plus even millionaires, even multimillionaires, I believe that. He wants good things for his children. And that includes in this world, you cannot neglect the physical. Those Christians who neglect the physical, you are actually operating in Gnosticism. You're neglecting the physical, saying the physical doesn't matter. You're in Gnosticism, saying the, the physical's bad. People who hate money and look at people who just earn six figures, which is the new middle class, and we're going to go into that soon. Six figures is the new middle class, not just what I'm saying. It's backed by evidence. You are neglecting the physical world because in this physical world, you need physical things to thrive in this body. You need food to eat. You need shelter, a house. You know how much houses cost? If you are in society, you need to pay for basic necessities, food, shelter, things such as that, which costs money. Housing is one of the most expensive things. And when you have a family, there are so many things that... You got to pay for the electricity, uh, insurance, house insurance. You got to pay for water. You got to pay for like medical. <laughs> I just, that just came across my mind, weirdly enough. That's one of the most expensive things in America. Medical. If anybody gets sick, I mean, these things cost money. And the Bible doesn't tell us to neglect the physical. And so if you're saying money doesn't matter, whatever, you know, I can just stay in poverty, you'll be okay. No, God doesn't want you to stay in poverty. If you are in poverty by happenstance, by an attack of the enemy, by whatever, God doesn't want you to stay in that. He wants better for you. Now, in Matthew 16, I'm going to show you a way that God actually used money. Yes, he used money to take care of things for himself and his disciples. This is Matthew 17 again, and we'll start at verse 24. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money, which is for the temple tax, came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute. Talking about Jesus Christ. He said, yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him saying, what thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter said, saith unto him. Of strangers, Jesus saith unto him. Then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast a hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, check this out. Thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and thee. So this is going to pay the temple tax for both Jesus Christ and his disciples. Jesus literally with his full and complete sovereignty. <laughs> yeah, it's so amazing. Yeah, what is so amazing. He has full sovereignty. If he wants anything he needs at any time, he can make it happen. And here he chose there was a financial need, a financial need of a temple tax and Jesus Christ literally made a miracle happen, making a coin literally come out the mouth of a fish. <laughs> that to me is amazing, just that story. Like, oh, we need some money, we don't have it. <laughs> what did Jesus do? <laughs> hey, go, go fish, get this hook, and this coin's gonna come out the mouth of this fish. I am the Lord, <laughs> I am the Lord, and I'm gonna make it happen. So that's, that's an amazing story of how God can provide and he did that with actual money because Jesus does not neglect the physical world. He does not neglect money. He knows money is an operation in this world, and therefore we need it. And he does not say, well, you know what? All money is evil. We can't even use it. We can't even, like, want it. No, he works with it. He works with it, and he definitely tells us not to put money over him. He definitely makes it known, do not put money above him. I'm repeating that. Do not put money above Christ because Christ is the one who gives us. It's a blessing. Christ is the one who created money. He created that. It's a tool. And he uses it for his benefit to benefit the kingdom of God. And it can be used for evil too. And people don't get this. They're rich men in the Bible. Not everybody that has money is evil. It's just a tool. But I don't know what it is. It's a mindset from the pits of hell. That, any, that money's evil in and of itself. No, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, not money itself. And people get the idea, just like that commenter. It's like, oh, so if money's so bad, if money's so evil, 
most people who say that they work a job. And if they don't work a job, they're mooching off somebody who does work a job. Oh, you don't want to work a job to earn money because it's so evil. But you'll, you'll stay in somebody's house who's working and you're not working. They're paying for your shelter. They're paying for electricity. They're paying for the internet that you're using to write the comment that you wrote to me. I'm not saying this is what the guy who wrote the comment to me did. But I'm just saying, church, there's people out there who are like that. They'll see money as evil and wicked and they'll still work a job. I'm like, okay, if it's so bad, stop working or give me your paycheck. I'll take it. If money's so bad, give me your paycheck. Why are you even earning it? <laughs> and if you're not earning it, they're mooching off somebody who is earning it. So is money really that evil? Let's be real. Don't be a Gnostic where everything that's physical is evil. No, that's Gnosticism. We're Christians. We don't neglect the physical world. We're here for a reason and... We're here for a reason. That, that simply it is what it is. God has us here for a specific reason, for his purposes. And we are not to neglect the physical world. But we should operate in this physical world and use the resources that we have to give God glory while we're here. Here we go. Here's another uplifting story that will give people hope who may be lacking. And also going to show that God provides and he cares about our physical provisions. Check this out, Luke 5. This is another miracle that Jesus did. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were, wa and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. And when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon, lacking faith, answering, said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night. This is what the disciples did for money. They were fishermen. They were working to earn money because they knew it was necessary to live in society. This is what they did, their jobs. Fishing, that's how they earned money. But Simon said, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at that word, I will let down thy net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. They had so many fish in that net, they couldn't even hold all the fishes, right? And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship. They called over another ship because they had so much fish they had caught. So like, come on over, we need help. That they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, overflow of abundance, and this is, again, fishermen is what they did to earn an income. So God literally provided them finances indirectly, helping them catch fish. But catching fish is what they did for income. So the Lord Jesus helped them catch this multitude of fish. They could end up selling him all that fish and make a good amount of money from that one days of fishing. I don't know how much that could last. Maybe a whole month's worth of work in that one evening or that one day. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. <laughs> I don't know. Did they lose all the fish that they caught? I don't think they did. I don't think God would do that miracle. And then they just lose all the fish they caught. But the point is that the Lord helped them on their job, what they did to earn money. The Lord provides. This was a literal miracle of provision, showing how God can provide. So God does not neglect our physical needs. If we need money, God can help provide. I showed you two different scriptures directly with the miracle showing how God cares for his children. He cares for human beings. He cared for his disciples, that he would provide for them financially. And so God himself does not think money is evil. He doesn't think it's bad. I mean, he can use it and he did use it and he will continue to use it to bless his people. But he also knows that too much money in the wrong person's hand and the wrong character it will corrupt the person. Just like, I don't know, if I'm a little kid and I have this really powerful weapon, I have a, a shotgun and I'm five years old, <laughs> that's going to be dangerous. It might even corrupt me. I'm like, oh, let's play, let's play. Don't mess with me. I got a real shotgun. Don't mess with me, Jimmy. That's my toy. But yeah, God knows what we can handle and he does definitely use money to bless us, for sure. Directly in the Bible, directly in Scripture, showed you right there. And now I'm going to show you how what I've been saying matches up with the facts, the economics of society, the livable wage you need today. It lines up with what I've been saying. And I haven't even done this research before I've been making those videos. I just made that choice. You need basically six figures if you're the sole income earner in your household. 
It was something that I just came up with on my own, but I actually Googled it and it lines up pretty succinctly. So what is a living wage definition history and how to calculate? The term living wage refers to a theoretical income level that allows individuals or families to afford adequate shelter, food, and other life necessities. The goal of a living wage is to allow employees to earn enough income for a satisfactory standard of living and prevent them from falling into poverty, which is what we don't want. Economists suggest that it should be enough to ensure that no more than 30% of the income gets spent on housing. The living wage is often subsequently the living wage is often substantially higher than the legal minimum wage. Makes sense. The minimum wage is 725 where I'm at in Georgia. That is not a living wage. The living wage at the federal level was $25.02 per hour for a family of four with two working adults at the close of 2022. Two years ago, by the way, inflation is crazy right now, so it's probably more. The last year for which statistics are available. Two working adults earning $20 an hour each or $41,600 a year wouldn't reach this threshold to adequately, adequately support themselves and their two children. This is the economic facts. The economic facts. And it's accounting for two incomes. It's accounting for two incomes, a household of four, two children, a family. So if it was just a single income household, double that. $50 per hour is a livable wage for just a single income household with a family of four, which is six figures. A living wage is a socially acceptable level of income that provides adequate coverage for basic necessities such as food, shelter, child services, and health care. The living wage, my voice is all raspy right now. <laughs> the living wage standard allows for no more than 30% of income to be spent on the rent, on rent or mortgage, and is sufficiently higher than the poverty level. The concept of living wages dated back to early American workers that made a higher pay. The living wage shouldn't be confused with the minimum wage, which is the least amount of money somebody can earn as mandated by law. Supporters of living wages say they boost productivity and employee morale. Uh, critics argue that they can hurt the economy and force corporations to reduce hiring. The consensus is that a living wage provides individuals with enough income support to support themselves without falling below the federal poverty line. It gives workers and their families the means to maintain a decent standard of living so that they can afford housing, health care, food, education, regular savings, other necessities. Is this too much to ask? No, this is a living wage. If you're not making a living wage, you're making an unliving wage, which is essentially poverty. <laughs> if you're not making a livable wage, you're it's not a living wage. You are in poverty or close to it. You can say that maybe. The ideal of a living wage isn't new, but it became a hot topic following the Great Recession. The economic crisis highlighted the fact that some individuals just can't afford to make ends meet. Some experts believe that people who don't earn living wage face challenges such as having to work more than one job, pulling the children out of school, and succumbing to unexpected health issues that they can't afford to address. And so if a health situation comes up, and you don't have the finances to take care of that. You're not earning a livable wage. The living wage in the U.S. is $25.02 per hour in 2022, or $104,077 per year before taxes. What did I say in my videos? I didn't even know this. This is just verifying what I already believed was a living, a, a basic, a good wage to earn uh, for a family, a minimum. And this is verifying exactly Exactly. If you want to live comfortably as a family in America in 2024, you need to make six figures if you are the single earner in the household. This is accounting for the average of all the cost of livings in America. So if you live in rural Kansas, you might be able to decrease that by half. You only need $50,000 household income to earn a livable wage. If you're in the country in Kansas where it's not as expensive, but if you're in San Francisco, <laughs> you need to double that, $200,000. You know, so it, it does depend on where you live, but this is the average of every like city and state and every cost of living average together. And so that's what I'm going by the average. So it says each adult would have to work 52 weeks a year, earning 52,000 for a 40 hour work week. That's an increase from 2416 in 2021. And so this is 2022 now. <laughs> so you can even raise this. You can even raise that. So the living wage in 2024 is probably more like 115,000. Probably more like that. So probably even above what I said earlier, 
100,000. And it's only rising. It's only rising. Look at this. The federal minimum wage, which is still this in Georgia where I live, $7.25 per hour. Yo, let's get a calculator just so I can show you how much that is per year. 7.25 times 40. $290 a week. Oh my goodness. This is so bad. A, a federal minimum wage is not a living wage. It's poverty. It is poverty in any state, in any state. Now let's multiply that up, times 52. $15,000 per year is the minimum wage in America. The federal minimum, that is. So it does vary depending on state though. So in California, it's saying that it's uh, $15 to $16. Now I think in 2022 or 2024. And that's still, that's still bad for California. It's still horrible. A minimum wage is not the living wage. Again, it's not the living wage. So check this out. What is the living wage in the US? The living wage in the United States is $25.02 per hour in 2022. Um, this varies by state, which I was saying earlier. The highest livable wage was for Massachusetts in 2024, 128,000. Mississippi, from Mississippi, the lowest living wage is $80,000. So again, if you're the single earner, income earner in your household, and you're in the cheapest state, you must earn at least 80K a year to be earning a livable wage. 80K per year in the cheapest state. <laughs> in the cheapest state. Now, this is a graph which is a little bit different. Middle class is a little bit different than the livable wage. They calculate it a little bit differently. It's just like the middle of the earners. They just calculate the middle of the statistics of the earners in America. And so this is going based on different cities. The lower end of middle class in California is 113,000. The upper end is 339,000. And so it changes and it varies based on the city, of course. Frisco, Texas, about 100,000. The cheapest on this list is Carmel, Indiana, 86,000, which is the lowest middle class on a specific list. Single income earner, if the man's earning all the income, 100K, at least six figures per year. Dual income, 50K per person. But I'm speaking for a single income earner. Because again, we cannot depend on our wives to continue earning for the rest of our lives. That should not be the goal. As God has called us to be the provider. If you're currently in that situation, you're not less of a man. You're not, you know. This could happen to me too. I might meet a woman, we get married, and I'm not earning six figures yet. And so we both work. But my goal is for that not to always be the case. I'm going to be working and creating more value, getting more skills, becoming more wise so I can end up earning six figures plus on my own because I don't want her to always be working for the rest of my life, for the rest of our lives, especially when she's raising the child. Like, I don't want that to be the case. And for whatever reason, if she can't work, I got to still make the bread. It's all me as a man, as a provider, as a protector. It's what God has called us to be. And so we shouldn't look at our lives like, oh, my woman, my wife's always going to be working. It's always going to be dual income. No, this is what society has become, but society is not on God's values, on biblical values. And that's why the American family is so messed up, because we haven't stuck to biblical, traditional values. We think, oh, time's changing, and we just need to switch up everything. We need to switch up how we do everything just because time is moving forward. But since when did time define truth, and since when did time define that we should change different things? If it's not broke, don't fix it. <laughs> Women overworking themselves, not doing what God designed them to do, not being in their soft girl era, not raising children and being homemakers and taking care of the house. Not saying a woman can't earn money. She can. Actually, the Proverbs 31 woman is an entrepreneurial-minded lady. That's what a Proverbs 31 woman is. But a woman's not meant to go out, go out all the time, go in an office job or, you know, just working 40 hours per week going out and just leaving the home and doing that 40 hours a week, every single week. That is not what a woman is designed to do. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. So us as men, we had to prepare ourselves. If you're not there, don't beat yourself up, but we had to prepare ourselves to get to that point to where we can provide for the whole house on our own without our wife doing it and helping us. Eventually, we got to prepare for that. May the Lord keep you saints and continually bless you always and shine his face upon you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen.